Yeah. I miss you, Tommy. Give it up for Tommy and the band. Give it up for everybody. Yeah, it's all. That was awesome. So I'm back. I've been gone a long time. Uh, this is how long I've been gone. Um, I didn't know any of the songs until Foo Fighters. I didn't know them. So you've learned new songs while I'm gone, but I'm back. Uh, you're going to get sick of me. But uh, hey, before we jump into this, let me uh, say this. Uh, coming up in, in all of our lobbies at all of, the, of our campuses is registration is underway. Or information is underway. Registration starts on Sunday for our men and women's retreats. They always sell out. So on Sunday, uh, online, uh, you can go online and you can register for that. And the men's retreat, they're both coming up in September. Um, and so we have this, this topic keeps coming up here, Flatters a lot. And that is that sovereign God has given you something to take care of a family, a relationship, your body, whatever that is. And, and we, a lot of us, we've given away too much and we're gonna take it back. We're gonna take back what God meant us, meant us to have. And so you can get on, uh, online to, on Sunday and you can sign up for that. And it, again, at all of our lobbies, at all of our campuses, you can find out uh, more information on that. Got it? I missed you. I did. So like this morning I was at Walmart like at four because that's the best time to go to Walmart because there's weird people there. But anyway, um, um, but, uh, but like the, the guy, one of my friends that works there, he, he's like, oh, so are you coming back? And I'm like, yeah. And then I went to the gym and, uh, and my friend at the gym goes, are, 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 are you coming back? And I'm like, yeah. And then I got an email going, are you dead? And uh, so, uh, <laughs> but I'm not dead. I'm not. Uh, I missed you. All right, let's pray. And then we'll jump into this, uh, this, this series of so God. Um, um, whatever uh, we've sung so far, there's some beautiful lyrics in there and, and there's some things that we stop and go, that, that's true or I want that to be true, whatever that, that is. But we come in here and uh, like we've been looking at over the last several weeks, we, there's rough parts of our life um, that we want to kind of get smoothed out maybe. And so we came in here just to, to lay our life beside your son Jesus and see how together our life with Jesus could be better. So teach us about Jesus. That's what we ask every week in here. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, uh, so uh, I want to pick it right up where Ben's been off. Uh, so, hey, give it up for Ben the last couple of weeks in here, all right? Um, I'm so proud of him. Uh, yeah, and he's almost over the diarrhea from the last week, so it's just, that's, that's a good thing. But uh, uh, I, want, I want to pick up. We've been in this series uh, uh, called Rough Crowd where we have been kind of unpacking and dismantling some of the, the false things that a lot of us grew up with, these assumptions or, or these teachings uh, around this question, what kind of people, like what, what kind of people that Jesus wants to use? A lot of us go, I bet he can use people like that or people like that. So we've been looking at that because a lot of us just have wrong information. What kind of people that Jesus wants to use and what are his expectations of the people that he wants to use, people like us. Like, what, what does God want me to be? What does he want me to do? What's his expectations? And, and so we keep bumping into this word of the last couple of weeks, and we're gonna, we're gonna go there again today, is that this concept called grace. And what happens when, 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 when rough people run into amazing grace? And it, it's pretty amazing. And, and here's what we've learned around here so far. So we're all on the same page. Let me talk about this word grace really, really quick. There's, grace is used all through the Bible. Grace exists on at least three different levels, maybe more. But, but here's what we've covered so far. Like, like the first level of grace goes like this. There's the grace that saves you. I'm saved by grace through, through faith, okay? That happens the moment you put your faith in Jesus. You don't have him all figured out, but you believe that he is the son of God and that what he did on a cross counts for you. At that moment, you're as saved as you're ever gonna be. And that's a one-time event that lasts forever. So if you get saved today and you put your faith in Jesus and then you screw up Thursday, you don't have to get re-saved. Okay, there's a church out there that teaches that. They're wrong. It's not, it's not in the Bible. So it's a grace that saves you. That's a one-time event. Then there's this other grace we've been talking about. There's a grace that changes you from the inside out. All right, that's the only thing that really, really matters. Jesus promised, you put your faith in me. I'll take away all your condemnation. Then I will move inside of you and I'll change what's inside. And then out of whatever is stored up inside, that'll come out. All right? So that's the second kind, the, the grace that changes. Here's the other thing. We're going to talk about this a lot. There's the grace that gives you the strength to do what needs to be done, all right? I, I'm forgiven, right? I'm forgiven. I, Jesus lives inside of me. Now what's he want me to do? And I have a choice. I have a choice, all right? I mean, let's, let's go back to this. So you, you, you're forgiven, all right? You're, you're absolutely forgiven. Now what needs to change? What needs to change and what do you want to do about it? See, grace can never be reduced to this get out of hell free card, all right? And then some people reduce it down to that. I'm forgiven anyway. He's not going to send me to hell if I die today. I'm going to heaven. Here's a follow-up question. So why change anything? A lot of people look at grace uh, like, like that. But, but grace, grace is all about removing 
I'm not afraid of hell anymore. I'm not. If I die today, I didn't, I didn't live a, a really good day, all right? But, uh, but if I die today, I'm going to heaven. I know, I know that. I'm not afraid of, heaven, of hell, all right? I, I have no separation. He took all the separation away between me and God. And so now God and I have unrestricted access to each other so he can change me. I'm going to heaven after I die, but I need, I need changing in this life. Anybody else? I need, my, my marriage needs help. My, my relationship with some people in my life need, needs help. I have some addictions and things that are none of your business that, that I, 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 need, I need help. I need change in this life. And Jesus says, I'll give you the grace to change. See, it's not passive. This is what Ben's been unpacking, right? So it's not passive. You're not gonna sit on your couch and go, you know, I went to church, I prayed to prayer, I got saved, now I'm watching football just waiting for Jesus to zap me. It doesn't work like that. You're gonna have to get some skin in the, green, in the game, all right? You're forgiven, all right, let's look at this again, all right? You're already forgiven. Now it's time to get to, get to work on healing up and changing the broken parts that need to heal and change. And that's really, really important. I'm forgiven, now let's get to work. Here, here's the way I was taught, okay? And maybe you take a picture of this or something like that to remember it. Grace is opposed to earning. You can't earn forgiveness. You can't earn your way into heaven. I, why, how'd you get to heaven? I earned it. I became a really good person. No, grace is opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to what? Now that I'm saved, I gotta work hard. Because it's not, it's, not it's not a passive thing. And, and a person's life, I don't care if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you or not, you put all your faith in Jesus. I'm telling you, change will not happen on accident. Right, I, I believed in Jesus, all of a sudden, we got along. No, it's never happened. It, nothing changes without a strategy. And that's what I've been looking at. We, we, we've been looking at, at some rough guys in the Bible Part of the rough crowd that Jesus ran into, most people think that he hung around with really, really spiritual, holy people. Eh, nope, not at all. He, he hung out with a rough crowd, and what happened when they bumped into Jesus? We've also, and we're going to look at that again today, we've been looking at some rough people that, that show up here at one of our campuses week after week after week. And here's what I want to unpack today, all right? What, what happens when rough people bump into, into Jesus? What happens when rough people, look at this, what happens when rough people bump into rough truth? What, what, what do you do? I was, I, was, I was fine, and then that landed on me. Now, now what am I going to do? I, I want to look at two guys, one in the Bible, one of the guys, one of the guys in the Bible, one other guy that goes to flat irons, and they're rough. I mean, here's what I mean by that. So if you ran into the, one of the, either one of the guys that I'm talking about, if you ran into them to, later tonight in an alley, you'd go, oh, they're rough. I mean, you go, this isn't going to go well. You would reach in your, in your pocket or your purse or whatever, and, and I don't know what you carry, a pepper spray or a whistle or an Uzi. I, I don't know what you carry to, to protect you, but you'd reach for it, and you'd start dialing 911 proactively because if Jesus isn't a part of their life, it's just not going to be a good night for you. And you know what? If Jesus is not a part of their life, you're, it's, gonna go, it's not going to go well. So I, I, the first guy I want to look at, um, his, his name is John. Now, now here's the thing that's so confusing in the Bible. It's like every other person's name is John in the Bible. It's like all the women seem to be named Mary, all of them, all right? And so, um, so there's John, but, but you're going to know who I'm talking about because John was given a nickname because of, he spent a lot of time doing this thing. Um, and you know, as soon as I say it, you're going to go, oh, I know who you're talking about. So John stood in a river a lot and baptized people, all right? In the Jordan River, he baptized all these people, right? And while, 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 while preaching. And, and so his name is John the... Okay, that's not a denomination. It's not like John the Methodist or John the, all right? He's John the Baptizer. It's the same, same word, all right? So John, he would baptize people. People would line up. They'd come out from town. He's in the middle of nowhere. They'd come out to the Jordan River, and here's what he would repent or, or, or teach. He'd, he'd yell this, hey, you, you need to repent. And that word comes up a lot here at Flatirons. And it's like, well, a lot of us went to church our whole life. We never heard that, heard that word at all. It's one of the number one words that came out of Jesus' mouth. Repent, what do you mean? You need to th rethink this. You need to change your mind about that part of your life or maybe all of your life. You need to turn your heart back towards God and rethink the strategy for how you're doing that and that and that and that. And here's why. Because the way you're living right now, it's not even close to what God says is right and true. You might want to rethink it. And when, Jesus, when, when John was out there in that river teaching, there was a sense of urgency about him. And here's why. Because he'd go, you might want to repent. And here's why. Because the one God promised, the, he's going to send somebody someday. And we now know he's talking about Jesus. Those people didn't, all right? The, the, one day, God said, I, I will send somebody. He's going to take away your sin, take away your condemnation, and, and reconnect you back to me no matter what you've done. He's on the way. Like any moment, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna show up. So you might want to rethink life. Uh, a prophet in the Old Testament, probably one of the most pro famous ones, his name was Isaiah. He wrote this. He, he said this, right before the Messiah shows up, 
And again, we know of Jesus, so I'll just say Jesus. So Isaiah was saying, right before Jesus shows up and does what he needs to do, here's what God's gonna do. He's gonna raise up this voice. Look at this. He's gonna raise up a voice of one crying in the wilderness. So somebody's gonna come out of the hills, out of the desert, out of the mountains, and they're gonna, this is what they're gonna say. Prepare the way of who? Of like, get ready, get, re- get prepared for, and we now know, get ready for Jesus. Make straight in the desert a highway for, for our God. And it's like he's saying, hey, listen, folks, you, you, want, you want to rethink how you're doing that. Be careful, all right? Here's why. Because God is about to keep his promise. He's going to send Jesus to us. So, so whatever's kind of crooked or messed up in your life, you might want to straighten it out so that nothing, nothing's in the way when, when, when Jesus finally shows up. He's about to keep his promise. So you might want to rethink the way you're living. So, so John was a, a, a baptizer and he, and he preached. And I don't, I don't know what you think about when you think of preachers or something like that. They're not all as cool as me. Here's what I mean by that, right? right? John, John was not that soft-spoken preacher that a lot of us grew up with. He wasn't the guy that stood the back door and goes, so sister, how are you? How's the arthritis? How's your mom? He, was, he wasn't that guy, guy, guy at all, right? No, no, he was, he was, um, he was rough. He was rough. He was a yeller. I like him, all right? He was annoying. He, 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 he spoke absolute truth, and he didn't, he didn't pull any punches. And again, a lot of our minds go to the person that stands on a street corner with a, with a sign and, and yells mean, 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 hateful things. John wasn't mean. He wasn't hateful. He was passionate. I mean, he was passionate. And people came out, and whatever John said, standing there in the middle of that river, they, they, they knew this. What? That... that That means there's hope for someone like me. Whatever he was teaching, ordinary people found hope. Whatever he taught them about God, they stood there on the side of the the river before they went in and got baptized and said, you know what? I think he's on my side. It's about time someone was on my side. By the time John the Baptist showed up or or later when, when Jesus shows up, people were so fed up with religion, they were just done. They stopped, they're like, no, I, I, I guess I'm going to hell. I just can't go back to that place where the religious people are because they judge me all the time. Judge me by what I look like, by, by, by what I eat, who I'm married to, what, what, I, what I drink, what I don't drink, whatever that is. Re- religion had, had been reduced down to um, uh, paying attention to the rich people and ignoring or exploiting the poor people. As a matter of fact, when Jesus shows up, um, this was actually being taught in all, all of the religious places of worship, is that if, if you're rich and healthy and everything's going good in your life, obviously you're a good person and God loves you. But if you're sick and poor and broken and things like that, then obviously you're a sinner and God's mad at you, so get ready to go to hell. I mean, that, that was it. And so people are like, I'm done. And you know, I understand. People don't change. Right? I mean, at least religion doesn't. So I, I remember a few years ago, and I've shared this it has been, it's been a long time. So, so my wife has a lot of health issues and, and bipolar and she, all, all this kind of stuff, seizure disorder. She's much better right now. We're in a good season. But, but, but back when we lived in Kentucky, Robin mustered all, all the strength she had to do carpool that day. I mean, it was like everything she had to get in the car and go pick up our kids at the Christian school that we, that we had them enrolled in. And she's sitting there in car, our carpool line and this religious lady, and I know she is, and they, they might listen online, so I'm not gonna say it, but this, this religious lady comes up and goes, taps on the window. She rolls it down and this is what she says to my wife. So Robin, I was praying, and now she has permission to say anything she wants, right? So I was praying and I'm, I'm thinking maybe the reason you're depressed and have so many illnesses is because there's a sin you haven't confessed. And Robin was like, bless you, or something like that, all right? And, and then she rolls up the window, and then she sinned, and then she came home, and she collapsed for about three days and went to bed, because, you know, but there's a lot of us believe that. We've been taught that. If you're sick, if you're poor, if you're broken, whatever that is, obviously you're a sinner and God hates you. And those people over there, that everything looks good, obviously they're doing something right. And then John the Baptist shows up. He stands out in the middle of a river and he goes, hey, 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 look, hey, look, look at me, all right, look, look. What those religious and people in all their fancy robes, you know, with their big books of laws and stuff like that, you know, what they taught you, it's not true. It, it is not true. It's not in, it's not, what they're teaching you about God and, and about what it takes to be with God, it's not, in, it's not in, in the Bible. God never said that. Now, let me be clear. The wages of sin of rejecting God is still death. Absolutely, all right? But let me just clear something up. It's not too late for anybody listening to my voice today. It's not too late. None of, none of you have done anything so bad so many times that God has says, no, go to hell. I don't, I don't want to talk to you anymore. But something, listen, but something needs to change, right? 
You might want to rethink how you're doing marriage or this or that or sex or money or parenting or this or whatever it is. And, and, and you, might want to, you, you might want to consider, and God is about to send somebody, so you might want to do it quickly, all right? And turn your life back towards God and trust that he will keep his promise. If people would stand and go, there's hope. I've, I've gone to church all my life. I've gone to synagogue all my life. No one's ever given me hope. And that guy standing in the river has given me hope that God hasn't forgotten me and that it's not too late for people like me. And actually God loves me and wants me to be his son or his daughter and be a part of his family. So people love John so much is that when they looked at him, they actually started whispering, maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the one that, that all those prophets were talking about. And, and John would overhear him go, whoa, whoa, time out. No, not me. That's not me. As a matter of fact, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. I mean, he's great. He's amazing, all right? I, I'm just here to get, get us all ready for him because he is on the way. John was rough. He loved the rough crowd. John was the rough crowd. I, I think John would have liked flat irons. <laughs> Most of you. All right, and uh, uh, so, so everyday common people that screwed up their life went out to that river and they loved him. They loved that rough guy. Because he offered hope. But not everybody liked him. Not everybody. Liked him. As a matter of fact, John's favorite people to target and yell at were religious people. So if you're a religious person going, you know, I don't even sin anymore. I'm pretty, pretty good. I should go to heaven, all right? Please pay attention, all right? So these religious people would come out to the river and they would stand a distance away from John because they didn't want to get all that sin on them, all right? And they'd stand up on a hill with their big robes and all their awards, religious awards. They'd carry books with laws in them and they'd take notes. Oh, I saw what you did you know, behind the barn, no, write that down, okay? And they, all these sins about, about all the people that, 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 that screwed up, all right? And John was nothing like them. As a matter of fact, let me describe John the Baptist to you. Every description in all the Gospels, uh, and he's in all of them, uh, he's described the same way. It says that from the time he was a little kid, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So kids, listen, you don't have to wait till you're like out of college or something to actually be a, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I mean, John, from the time he could walk, from the time anybody could, could remember him, he was filled with the Spirit of God. It says that he grew up and he became strong. And it translates, he was a physically strong dude. He wasn't this, hey, uh, would you mind stop sinning? That wasn't John, all right? He was this, this buff mountain guy. It says, he said as soon as he could, he, he left home and he didn't go to town and get a job. He, li he lived in the mountains. He lived in the, in the desert. This is my favorite part. It, it says that, um, um, that, he, uh, that he took the, the same vows. I never put this together. He took the same vows that Samson did. You know Samson? Got to beat up the world. All right, that, that guy, right? Meaning this is that he never drank alcohol. He only ate special foods. We'll get to that in a minute, all right? He never cut his hair. He never shaved his beard. He was this big hairy dude, all right? And then, again, and then this is what he wore, okay? Because all the religious people, anybody that was respectable, all right, they wore robes and hats and pointy hats and all that kind of thing, carried books and tassels and all that kind of stuff. Not John. It says, it says that John the Baptist wore, and it can be translated a different way. It could be a robe, a tunic, or a loincloth made out of camel hair, just awesome, all right, all right? And, and, and he put on with a, which, which is like, like picture either a, um, a kilt or a, a loincloth held up by this leather belt, all right? And, and, and he, ate, he ate wild locusts with grasshoppers. He ate bugs and, and he'd climb trees and he would get honey out of the tree and he, that's what he ate, all right? I, I just think that's awesome. And some of you are going, yeah, this is poor, poor, but he was poor, right? No, no. I mean, if he, if he could afford better clothes, he would have bought better clothes, right? If he could eat at restaurants and, you know, go out to eat and stuff like that, he would have. No, no, no. His, go back to the Christmas story. There's two old people, right? Elizabeth, all right, and Zacharias, all right? And they were old, and then they had a baby. So, so John, and that's John the Baptist. John the Baptist's dad worked in the temple, and at that time, priests were loaded. Loaded, all right? So if he wanted to eat better, he could have eaten better. If he wanted to wear nice clothes, he could have done it. You know why he dressed like that and ate like that? As a complete statement, I reject religion, Reject everything, right? And I, I love this, all right? Because I always try to put myself in that story and go, what would it have been like to, to be there? So, so, so look at it. So John would be like standing out there in the middle of the river teaching about, about God's about to send somebody. Let's change, change our lives and turn back towards God. He'd be out there and then he'd look up on the hill and there'd be these religious people looking down at him and he'd go, excuse me, I'll, I'll, we'll get back to that, all right? And he'd look up there and he'd stop his sermon and he'd point at him, all right? And you gotta picture this, all right? You gotta just close your eyes and picture this, all right? Picture this, this like Samson-like, dude standing in the middle of a river he's got long hair all right he's got a beard with honey in it and probably bugs and stuff like that all right and he's standing in the middle of the river wearing like a, a camel hair speedo which had to itch which is probably why he yelled all the time it's like this is miserable whatever that is all right and he's yelling at these snobby religious people on the bank he loves all of you I want, I want to talk to them real quick hey you bunch of snakes 
I'm not talking to the balcony, although if it applies, you can lean into it, all right? Um, you bunch of snakes, I warned you, I warned you. Listen, I know who you are, I know what you do to people, I know what you do under God's word, and you better knock it off. You better repent, and here's why. You're like a tree that doesn't bear fruit, and there's somebody on the way, and they got an ax in their hand. They're gonna cut you down, and they're gonna burn you in hell. And that didn't go over well at, at all. You know, so, so I watch a lot of movies. Uh, my, one of my favorite movies is Braveheart, and if you haven't watched that, you're not an American. All right, so, uh, but remember that time when you have an army over here and an army over here, and then, and then uh, Braveheart's, uh, Wallace's army is yelling at all those people, and then when he's like, makes his point, makes a mic drop, he turns around, and the whole army moons. I can't prove it, but I, I'm pretty sure that's what John the Baptist did, all right? <laughs> hey, religious people, Woo. I can't prove that. Um, that's my opinion. I would have done it, but that's me, all right? But anyway, all right, it didn't go well. And so, you know, then they wanted to say, they were like, hey, they'd send him messages. You need, you need to shut up about that. You need to stop teaching that. You need, but you know what? They couldn't do anything about it. You know why? Because the people loved him. The people loved him because he was teaching truth. They never told him that what he was saying wasn't true. They just said, we don't like it. And so they, uh, they just tried to kind of undermine his credibility. They started spreading this rumor around. Uh, you know, you can't trust him. He has a demon. Look at him. He's got bugs in his teeth. He's got hair. He wears a Speedo, whatever that is, all right? And so, and so they didn't say what he said wasn't true. They knew it was true. They just didn't like it. But, but uh, religious people weren't the only people on, on John's list. He also had a special place in his heart for politicians, Right, because here's what, here's what, this is in the Bible, but the only, the only, John knew that politicians, I'm not that bad, come on, all right, um, <laughs> that, it's okay, it's okay, it's all right, I've had a bunch of them, and no more. But, uh, that, um, <laughs> see, John, John knew, and this is true, and this is going to be hard for us to believe, John knew that the reason God put kings and governors and presidents and things in place was, <laughs> is, was to be role models, I know, all right, just hold on, all right? Like, like, like to, for people to look up to and go, there, finally, there's a man or woman of credibility. There's, a, there's actually somebody I can trust. He, he, God, this is in, in the book of Romans, God put government in place to be protectors of people who could not protect themselves. That, that is why government was put in place, okay? So take a breath and just push through it, all right? Now, now then King Herod, so King, King Herod was the, the king of Israel at that time. So, so this is why this room is middle school and above, okay? Because the Bible is not a Disney movie. So they make a movie about, about it. a lot of you would go, well, oh, oh my, I wish I had not brought my kids to this. Let me, tell, let me tell you this. So King Herod looks over at his sister-in-law who's married to her, his brother Philip, all right? And, and goes, well, I want that, but I'm married to her. And she's married to my brother, that's okay, I'm king. So he throws his wife, kicks his wife to the curb, right? And then she says, just divorce my brother, be fine. And so she, 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 she divorces him, they have an affair, then, then they get married. And just like King David last week, we got away with it until John finds out. And John works it into every sermon he can. So he's preaching about God and how God loves us. And by the way, did you know what Herod's doing up there in the palace, all right? And he sends all these messages over, over to, to King Herod. Hey, King, hey, listen, what you're doing is wrong. You need to repent. You need to turn your heart back towards God or he's gonna deal with you, right? He's, he's, gonna, he's gonna deal with you. And this doesn't go over well with Herod. Like Herod does not respond the same way that King David did. We talked about, like, like as soon as he's confronted with his sin, David went, you're right, I, I'm the man. What, what do I need to do that's, that's different? No, no, Herod gets, um, he gets defensive, he starts making excuses. He starts rationalizing it. He gets angry. And finally, he just sends some guards out and goes, just arrest the guy. Put him in prison so he will shut up about what I'm doing over here. And it gets worse. Here's, here's the rated R part, right? So this is the parent of the year fail story, all right? So if you're, if you're feeling like you're a bad parent, you're going to feel better about yourself in just a minute, all right? So, so, so King Herod has a birthday, all right? And so uh, at his big birthday party, his wife, Herodias, Herod and Herodias, all right, who makes this up, all right? So Herodias goes, I got an idea. Go dance for your uncle slash stepfather, okay? And, and so and when you think dance for your, for your uncle slash stepfather, don't, so like couple, last month, my, my, my four-year-old Emery had a dance recital, okay? So cute, cuter than any of your children, all right? So she's out there and she's like, good ship, lollipop. That's not what we did here, okay? Don't think cute little dance recital. Think um, Beyonce <laughs> at her strip teasiest. Okay, because tradition says this, is that when you went and danced for the king, women danced naked. So here's, here's, here's King Herod's stepdaughter slash niece dancing naked for her uncle, and his response is, what do you want? 
What do you want? He's so moved by the experience, by her art, whatever that is. What do you want? I'll give you half my kingdom. Just tell me what you want. And she's smart. So Beyonce, that's not her name. I made it up. All right, but she goes back and she goes, Mom, what should I ask for? Oh, I, I know. She goes back to Herod. So I want the head of the guy in prison, John the Baptist, that keeps criticizing what's going on here. Bring me his head on a platter. And that's how he dies. That's how, that's how John the Baptist dies. Now, l- listen to this, all right? You could describe John the Baptist with a lot of words. Let me tell you about how Jesus described him. Some people was asking John, Jesus about John the Baptist one time. This is what Jesus said about him. He said, he's the greatest man born of women. Wouldn't you like Jesus to say that about you? Oh, Jim, greatest guy on earth. There you go, all right? All right no, no, greatest man ever born of women. You know, so that, he's great. He was great. Here's another word that you would describe John the Baptist. He was rough. I mean, look, rough looking. Look at him. Rough, rough acting, rough talking. He hung out with a, a, a rough crowd. And people loved him and hated him for the same reason. You know what it was? He told the truth. That's all he did. He just, he just stood and told the truth. And, and is this still, people don't change, all right? The same as 2,000 years ago. We respond differently to truth. Right? Like here's some of us back then and in, in, this, in this room right now. When we hear truth, we, we sit here in rooms like this and go, I know. I know. I know something needs to change in my life. And, and I'm willing to make those changes. If truth is presented in such a way that also says there is a way to a better way and it is possible for people like you, if Jesus steps into your life, if, if, if that's actually true, if you promise Jesus will help me become this man that I, I don't know how to be on my own, I'm in. What do I need to do? And that's why people were baptized by John. By the thousands and his assistants, they're in that river. I want something better. I want to change my mind about my life. I want to turn my heart back towards God. What will it take? I'm in. I'll do it. And some of us, that's how we respond. All right? But some of us, it's different. We, we hear truth, and we sit in churches like this, all right? And, and, or the church you used to be in or the church you're going to be in in the future, right? And, and, and somebody like me is going to say something true, and you're going to sit here and go, that is true. And inside you're going, and I'm not going to do it. Right? I, I'm not going to change. I don't want to change. I believe Jesus said it. I believe it's in the Bible. I, I believe there's like 50 verses about that. I'm not going to change. I don't want to. And this is why people hated John. John, John said one time, because they went, are you Jesus? Are you like the Messiah? He goes, I said, I'm not the light. I'm not the light. He's on his way. I'm not the light. I came to testify and teach you about the light that's about to shine into your life. And, and you know what? A lot of us, we don't want light. I, I'll give you an example of this. It's going to get really quiet and awkward in here, all right? But everybody's going to know exactly what, I, what I'm thinking or what I'm talking about, right? I want you to go back through your life all the way back to when you were a kid, all right? And some of you are about to stop breathing, all right? But I want you to go back and, I, and just pick out one thing that you've done wrong with another person or by yourself in, in a dark room with a door that you thought was closed, okay? And all the guys are looking straight ahead. All right, all right, look. And imagine if somebody opened the door and turned on the light. How do you feel? That's how King Herod co- felt when he got called out. You get angry, you get embarrassed, you get defensive, and you want to fight. Who do you think you are? Right, that's how the, that's how the religious people felt when, when John went, hey, you're wrong. They didn't, they didn't say, no, I'm not. They just said, who are you? Who are you to tell, 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 tell me? He did it to religious people. He did it, he did it to Herod. It's, it's what we do, right? They couldn't argue with John, so they just tried to discredit him. And when the people didn't care about the lies they were spreading about him, they just, they just killed him. That'll shut him up. I'm not changing my life. What does it take to shut your mouth? Oh, and they cut his head off, right? Hey, here's how we would say it today, right? They shot the messenger because they didn't like the message. Right? We did it with John, you know. They, they did the same thing with Jesus. Think about it. Right? Th- th- think about this. One time Jesus was backed into a corner and they were trying to discredit him and say, you don't have any right to tell us what we need to do right or wrong or different in, in our life. And here's what, here's what Jesus said. He said, you know, John the Baptist, remember him? He cut his head off a couple weeks ago. John the Baptist has come eating no bread because that vow he took. I'm not going to eat bread. I'm going to eat grasshoppers. All right, all right. John the Baptist come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. He's so spiritual and devoted to God. You go, he's he's weird. He's he's a, he has a demon inside of him. Don't listen to him. Then then Jesus says, the Son of Man. So Jesus has come eating. He I eat bread and drink. I drink a lot of wine, and you say, well look at him. 
He's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And it's like Jesus is going, can't win with you people. You won't listen to anybody. Somebody says something that you don't like, even though it's true, you know what you do? You do what you always do. You attack the one telling the truth. You step on any toes yet? Because mine are bleeding, right? So, so let me ask you this, right? Let's get towards the application. H- how do we react? How do you react when truth has you backed into a corner? Do, 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 do you listen? Do, I, do we listen? Do we admit, yeah, I, I don't want, I want something needs to change. Do we make a new strategy or do we fight back? There are certain people in my past, without those people, I would have probably ended up in prison or something like that. I think uh, anybody with a, you know, with the ability to be violent, uh, you better choose to be a good guy because the only other alternative is that you're a bad guy, you know. I'm Cody Donovan. Uh, I've been going to Flatirons for about eight years. Uh, my wife is named Julie, and our daughter's name is Cora. I'm a retired UFC fighter, and um, I own a, a gym here in town called High Altitude Martial Arts. Uh, I'm also coached with the Elevation Fight Team. I did some jujitsu when I was 19, 20, um, but then went off to college and. I thought that I had to do things the way everybody else does, so I was gonna get a real job. I was gonna, you know, sit at a desk and like be this person I'm not. And that was very difficult. Started training jujitsu again and realized that there were people there who were literally professional fighters, that they made their living fighting. And as soon as I found out that that was an option, uh, I was all in, all in towards that. You know, you have to be selfish as a fighter. You have to, you have to do what's best for you. You have to, you have to eat right that day. You have to make sure you get your training in that day, right? Like nobody's gonna go train for you. Nobody's gonna learn how to fight for you. So you have to be selfish. The downside of it is there's a lot of idolatry that happens when you're a fighter. You literally start to like think that you are the answer to everything. You really start to like worship your skills and you almost just start to like worship yourself basically. At that point in my life, I think that I was weighing all of my success by my ability to to beat people up. I was no longer religious in any way. I didn't think there was a God. Um, I mean, I would even go so far as to say that I looked at people I knew that were religious and I thought that they were just weak-minded. I was on the road. Uh, I was fighting in Bellator and I was in the room having a panic attack and things were just, I was really, really low place. I was just kind of weighing like where my life was at the time and just like this just this selfish person that I was right and I started to pray. I was praying I was talking out loud and I was talking in my head and and I was answered you know I didn't hear I didn't necessarily hear a voice but I felt it it was warm it felt like somebody wrapped me in a warm blanket and they just said I didn't go anywhere you know like you know, you, you, you've been trying to do this on your own, but I was with you the whole time. That's, that, that's basically what I got. And it was, I mean, like I got, you know, I get goosebumps right now. Just, it was, like it was intense, you know. So in jujitsu, um, one of the special things about the mat is the, the mat does not lie, right? If you are fat and you're out of shape, if you have been slacking off and not training, the mat's gonna show it. The mat is an honest place where you are forced to face your, the consequences of, of the lifestyle that you're living. That's what it felt like in that hotel room nine, eight, nine years ago. Um, you know, it was, it was just like being on the mat. All, the, the consequence of all of these actions, of the lifestyle that I was living, I, was, I, was, I, was, I had to sit down and I had to face that truth. And unlike the mat, God was nothing but forgiving. I felt like the God or the Christ that I had a relationship before was a very fake relationship. I mean, there was no relationship. It was just this forced thing that I was forced into my grandparents and parents. And I really wanted to get to know, I wanted to get to know Jesus. You know, and the only person that I knew that, that, uh, that had a relationship was Vinny Lopez. So I, I asked Vinny about that. And Vinny told me to come to Flatirons. Like I didn't accept God in that hotel room and say, I'm sorry, and all of a sudden my life was freaking great. That's not the way it, it happened. But it definitely got, it just definitely got a lot better, you know? 
I don't know. I mean, I still look at myself every day and think like, oh, that's selfish and this and that. If there is any good that's happening here, it is literally only because of my relationship with Christ. I'm, I'm leaning on that. I don't, I don't know. I know that I can't, I know that I can't do it by myself. I know that. I mean, I, I tried to do it by myself. You know, I, I just thank God every day. I mean, I'm, I'm just so surrounded by blessings and there are all these things that are outside of my control. I, I have a beautiful wife, I have a beautiful daughter. I get to do what I love every single day. All these people have to go to work and I go in and I do jujitsu and I teach people how to fight. I, I just feel so blessed and, and yeah, that's it. So a couple things I want you to hang on to. Uh, I don't care how strong you are, how many people you can beat up, I don't care how rich you are, whatever, right? Um, Cody and, and Vinny, without Jesus, hurt everybody in their life. And Cody and Vinny with Jesus are two men I would, I would go to the mat with. I really would. See, well, go back to that video. When, here's a quote that, that Cody said just a minute ago. He said, he said when, when you're on the mat, right, it doesn't lie. When you're on the mat, it's a place of complete honesty where you have to face the truth and the consequences of how you've been living your life. Right? There's a place where you have to go, I have to face it, and it's going to be revealed. The truth and consequences will be revealed on the, on the mat. And that's a metaphor for life, because we all get up out of this room, and we go out there, and we go in the ring, whatever that is for you. For, for, for you, the mat is, I'm going back to marriage, I'm going to school, I'm going to, to work, I'm going to whatever that is. I, I'm going to go on a date. I'm, I'm going back to religion. And, and here's what's happening. Here's the reality in a lot of our lives. We keep going back to the mat and getting our butts handed to us over and over. And we know, you know, I know why. It's because it's I'm doing something wrong and it's not working. And the truth is, this is not going to go well. Ready? Like the last one didn't go well. And the one before that and the one before that because I'm the same person and nothing has ever changed. Some of us know it's not working. It's not working, and it's going to end badly. And some of us go, whatever it takes, what, whatever it takes. But some of us will go, you know what? I'm going to do it again. I'm not changed. I would rather, I would rather try to argue with why, not what Jesus says is not true. Why, what Jesus says is true won't work in my life. And what we're saying is, I just don't want to do it. I, I, just, I, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to change that part of my life. I, I, I don't. I know Jesus said it. I know it'd probably be better. I, I know my wife, my, my husband, my boyfriend, my parents. I know they want me to do that. I, I just don't want to do it. We're, we, we haven't changed in 2,000 years. We're just like the religious people looking back at, at John the Baptist going, I'm not admitting I'm wrong. I'm not going to take advice from some hillbilly, hairy, redneck, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, you know, preacher who doesn't understand my life and the pressures I face and what she did to me and how I feel because of, of that. I mean, I mean, might, maybe back then, but I'm educated and I'm cultured and I'm sophisticated and I have a high pressure of life, not like that stupid Christianity stuff. I, I, that won't work for me. And what we mean is, even if it work, I'm not willing to put in the work to make it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I think about the sin that's going on in my life. I'm going to do a series on this late, later this fall. All the sin that's still going on in my life, and I can pray about it and confess it and go to crucible and blah, 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 blah. You know what? The sin that's still in my life is pretty much the sin I just want there. I'm just being honest with you. So, so over the last several weeks, you know, Ben and some of the guys in the, in the video have mentioned, you know, they, they went to that retreat, that crucible retreat, and God used that to start some things in their life. You know, one of the biggest truths that I've learned about myself happened after that. After that, and it goes like this. Somebody will do something to me or say something to me or they want to do something or say something. I'll just watch them do it, all right? And it brings up some energy in me, more than it deserves. And I'll go off. And here's what I've learned. What they just did doesn't have so much to do with what they did as it pulled the trigger in me about something I don't like about myself, all right? And that goes in all areas of my life. Like my wife, you know, say we have a fight. That's hypothetical, whatever, okay, but um, let, let's say we get in an argument or something like that, you know, she says something or does something and it pulls my trigger and I let her have it. And then, you know, a, hours later or days later when I'm going, I'm really, really sorry, really sorry. Here's what I admit, that you, it, there's actually something else going on. You just triggered it. I've, all my life, parents, you understand this, all right? Like my, my kids usually are the recipient of it. See, I'm a stuffer, all right? So whatever happens at work, what happens with, 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 with marriage or what happens, doesn't happen in marriage, whatever that is, I, I don't wanna just like 
be vulnerable or something like that. So, so here's what I do. I just put it in this closet and I stuff it and I stuff it and I stuff it and I stuff it. And then when my kids, when they were little, they would walk by, by and they not, didn't even do anything that big. They were just the last thing and they got the whole avalanche poured on them. Same way at work. There's some annoying people at work and you know who you are. And, and here's what I mean is, is, is you, do what you do what you do. And you know, my first response is not to ask you what's going on in your life. My first response is to power up on them and go, you're fired, Right? People in traffic cut me off, or how about this? There's this lady in a Subaru Outback on Highway 7 Thursday, and she should not have a license. And, I, I, she, and, you know, and, and I, I blew up at her. I'm like, oh, you're right. And, so, and here's what it is. I don't want to talk about it. You know, I'm an outside processor, but don't ask me about it in the lobby because I'm fine. All right? But here's what, whenever you look at stuff like that, it is a mirror, and it reflects stuff back about me, and I don't want to talk about it. So I yell or I honk, or I drive that Subaru off the road into the St. Vrain River and hope she dies and goes not to heaven. And that, that's, I, I, I'm not a good person. You should know that by now, right? So, uh, but you know what? But I, what I don't wanna do is admit, you know what? You're not the problem, I am. I'd rather say she's, she's stupid or you're dumb or that was a stupid mistake or you shouldn't be this or whatever. Get out, get out of my way. I'd rather run over you than admit to myself or to God or how about what Ben said last week, to actually go up to another person and go, so there's a broken part of my life I need to talk about and it needs to change and I don't know what to do. And some of us are right here sitting there going right now going, I don't want to talk about it. You know, some of us are at, we're, we're sitting here right now and here's what we're going. I, I, I get it. I, I, get, I agree with everything you said. I tried it. It didn't work. I went to counseling, I did the five steps to whatever that they said in that book, I went to shift, I went to this, I went to all the things that I was supposed to fix this and it didn't work. And you know what, I'm not gonna get my hopes up anymore. It's not gonna change. This is my life. And I'm just trying to figure out if I can stay with it or just leave. This is where some of us are, all right, I get it. So let's go back and then we're gonna, I'm gonna ask some questions, we're gonna sing a song and get out of here, but let's go back to what Ben's covered over the last couple of weeks. Big points here, all right? First one goes like this. God's grace and strength are, are more than enough. That's what Jesus said. Well, whatever you're going through, whatever you have to do, whatever, let me tell you, you don't have to do it by yourself. God's grace, my grace and my strength in you, it's, it's, it, it, it's enough. It's, it's, not, it's not just enough, like I barely squeeze by. It's more, it's, it's more than enough. And here's, some of you are going, but I, I'm, not, I, I'm not good enough. All right, how, how about this one? Um, Jesus is enough. To make you enough. I loved it when Ben said that a couple weeks ago. Jesus, I know I'm not enough. I, 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 you know, I still tailgate. I still yell at Robin. I still want to fire people. I want, to, I, I want to run over you. I want to power up on you, you know, because I'm not a good person. I'm not enough. But Jesus in me is enough to make me enough. So let's just put this in, in Flatirons context. The way we say it around here, if you're new, is there are two deals on the table, right? I've said this so many times, hundreds of times, right, right? Two deals on the table. The first one goes like this. Jesus is actually telling me the truth and he will supply what I need to change into and who and what I was, I was meant to be. So uh, that's true, all right? The same power that raised Christ from the dead is available in me to go back to Robin and go, okay, let's work on this. Or to go to my kids and say, let's work on it and to pray for that lady. And if you're here, you should drive. You know, all, right, that's, all right, all right, all right. So, so either his grace and his strength is enough. That's one deal. Or how, how about this? Or Jesus is a liar and he can't help. Those are, those are your options. Jesus really is telling me the truth or he's a liar and he can't help anything and I am on my own. But none of us want to say that. So here's, here's what we say. So I, I believe that Jesus is enough and he can give me the grace to, to do all that I need to do. Here's the rest of that sentence though. I just don't want to do it. I don't want to do what it takes. That's going to hurt. It's going to be inconvenient. It's going to, it's going to, you know, if I do that, if I hold on to that, I, I, it, just, it just won't go well. So I'm not going to change. Right, let me use Co Cody's words, all right? The math... The mat called life is, it doesn't lie. It's total honesty and is and will reveal what's going on and what needs to change. And there are consequences at attached to it, whether you want to admit it or not. But it's up to you, right? You're forgiven. We don't have to worry about that anymore. And Jesus lives inside of you to give you the grace to do whatever needs to be done. Now it's your choice because you're not a puppet. See, G no, go back to Cody's story. Nobody can make Cody, nobody can make Cody do anything. It just wouldn't go well. But nobody can make Cody say, I'm gonna give up control of your life and follow God's plan. That, that's above all of our pay grades, all right? That was something he had to work out and actually come to a point of, of belief. John the Baptist didn't look up the bank of those rivers uh, at all those people who were turning away and chase them down and go, no, 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 no. I'm gonna make you. J Jesus never put anybody in a headlock and went, I'm gonna change your life whether you like it or not. 
He didn't do that, and he still doesn't do that. Jesus does today the same thing he did back in the Bible. It goes like this. Jesus turns on the light and goes, this is true. This is just true. This is true about me. This is true about my father. This is true about you. This is true about what's going on. This is true about marriage. This is true about sexuality. This is true about money. This is true about parenting. This is true about on, 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 right? And then, then this, this is how he'll end it all. Okay, all right, now come follow me. Let's go. But I'm not enough. I know. Here's some grace. More than enough. Now, and we, we decide. We decide what we want to do. Do we want to take hold of the truth and follow Jesus? And if we make mista- when we make mistakes, his grace will pick us back up. Or do we want to attack the one delivering it? And we do it all the time. Let me, let me tell you what's happening in this room right now. And if it won't happen this week, it'll happen next week. But it's happening this week right now, okay? Here's what's going on right now. I said something, or I'm about to say something, or Ben said something, or Scott said something, and you sat there and you go, that makes me mad. Not because it's not true. Especially when we hit on anything that sounds a little bit political or a little bit has been debated out there in the social world. We don't hit on them because they're political or social, because Jesus talked about it. So this is it, right? And it offends you, and you get all indignant and stuff like that. Not because you don't think it's true, but because if you take hold of that, it will cost you. And you don't, you don't know if you wanna, you wanna pay that price. It'll cost me. If I hold on to what he says about fill in the blank, people at school, people at work will think I'm hateful and mean and things like that. I, I, will lose, I might lose my job if I hold on to that. So here's what you do. You don't say what Jesus says isn't true. Here's what you do. You sit in rooms like this and you go, well, that's your opinion. And this is my favorite. You know, there's different ways to interpret that. Yeah, well, give me another one. Well, I just heard there was. All right, all right. Here, here's what a lot of you are sitting here right now. If I pulled out marriage or if I pulled out parenting or if I pointed at anything in my life, you, you, you sit in this room and you go like, who do you think you are to tell me how to run my marriage, how to, how to express my sexuality, how to raise my kids? Who do you, who do you good, I mean, good for you. You don't have my life. You have no right to speak into my life. You'll get critical of me, right? You get critical of me. You, you'll, 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 look at, you, you'll look at going, well, you know what? I, don't, I, I know he taught about Jesus and stuff like that, but I don't think he should have said that Beyonce strip tease thing. That is just over the line. I'll get that email 15 times this week. I'll, I'll read it and then I'll throw it away, just so you know, right? I, I don't think you should say that thing about, you know, Herod. I don't think you should say that thing about, about John the Baptist being like, I don't think you should say any of that. If I haven't said anything that offends you, just stick around, all right? But it, but, and, you, and you might leave because of methodology. I don't think we should play Foo Fighters in church. Okay, that's not a thing about right or wrong. That's just your opinion. If you want to leave because of an opinion, you know what you will not leave for? What they're teaching there is not true, all right? It's true. It's true, what we teach here is true. The problem is you just don't like it, and so here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna shoot the messenger, or you're just gonna go find another church that tells you that you're okay just the way you are, and nothing needs to change. By golly, God likes you, so don't change. And if you mess, mess up, don't worry about it, there's grace. Let me just tell you this right up front. Heads up, we're not that church. We're, we're not, we are, let me tell you who we are. And Ben's hit this every week, we are a rough crowd. We are a rough crowd church that knows something needs to change in our life because they're broken parts. And we don't know how it's possible except for this, through Jesus, maybe it is. We're gonna hold on to Jesus. And that doesn't always go well. You know, the people that, uh, that, that nailed Jesus to a cross never told Jesus what you're saying is untrue. They, they knew it was true, they just didn't like it. So what do I need to do? I will crucify you like I beheaded your cousin. We still do that today. I do. I'm not teaching anybody in here except teaching myself, speaking to the mirror. So let me give you some application questions. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm two minutes over. I'm back. Uh, and uh, <laughs> all right, and so then, and, and again, this is between you and God. So let me hear some questions. How about this? What's one part of your life? And you know, we could be here until next weekend if you go list them all. But just what's one thing going on in your life that you know and by that, no, he's like, you don't have to pray about it, all right? But it's, it doesn't line up with what God said is true. And you know what? You're not sitting here going, ah, oh, mm. I can't think of one. <laughs> I'm like Jesus. No, 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 no. So, so, you know how Ben had us raise our hands last week, okay? And you're not going to confess anything to anybody, all right? Does anybody in this room or one of our campuses have anything going on in your life that's not exactly the way Jesus would want you to do it? By show of hands. You're a rough crowd, okay? That, that's my, my point, okay? Followed by this, all right? Do you want that part of your life to change? Right, and don't nod at me. All right, why hasn't it? Why hasn't it? Because Jesus rose from the dead, your sins are forgiven, and he lives inside of you. And the truth is, I just don't want it to change right now. I'm not ready to change that part of my life. Okay, okay, but let's say you are. 
Let's just say you are, hypothetically, okay? So here's the next question. What is the first thing that Jesus would, would tell you to do? And why would he tell you to do that? Because he wants to spoil your fun, or maybe he wants something better for you, right? So, so here, here's the following. I only have two more, right? So what's one thing you're willing to do? What's one, not, I'll pray about it, I'll think about it. No, you know, there's one thing. I'm gonna get up out of this room, I'm gonna get my car, get my truck, I'm gonna, and you know, by, by, by Tuesday, I, I'm gonna do one thing to move back in that direction towards what Jesus says is right and true. What's one thing? And you know what, I would even say this. It's like, I would write it down. You know, if you really, really had uh, guts, here, here's, here's what you do. You would do what Ben suggested last week, and you'd go to another person and go, hey, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm gonna trust you. Um, there's a part of my life that's broken, and I want it to be different, and I gotta come up with a better strategy, and I just needed to tell you that. Will you do this with me? But that's too convicting. But how, how about this, all right? Um, if you were to ask, and that's what we're about to do, by the way, if you were to ask Jesus, do you believe that Jesus will keep his promise, because he promised, to supply what you need so that what needs to change in your life can really change? Do you believe Jesus will actually do that, or, he, or he's lying to you? Do you want your life to change? And you've tried it on your own, but do you think Jesus might actually show up and actually change that part of your life that you can't? And do you want that to happen? Let's stand up. I'm going uh, to pray, and we're going to sing a song. And, uh, and it's probably going to be a quiet car ride home. All right? Because your wife's going to go, what did you raise your hand about? And no, don't. <laughs> so God, um, here's the thing. is every, Everything and almost everybody in our life has a finger in our chest telling us what we do wrong and why we should be condemned and why we should be ashamed and things like that. And then uh, maybe even tonight um, is a John the Baptist moment where people are sitting here going, maybe there's hope for someone like me because maybe... The goodness of Jesus is better than and bigger than my sin. Maybe the grace is more than enough. And maybe his strength is what I've been waiting for all my life. And nobody's going to put him in a headlock and nobody's going to threaten him and no one's going to make him do anything. But if they were to ask, if we were to ask, I really believe you would keep your promise to show us just one step and give us the strength and the grace and the mercy to do that. Because you're good. You're so good and we need you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.